Geology, geology, geology. This is the mini geology program from Houston, uh, Montrose headquarters, Houston, Texas, USA. Good morning to everybody. We're going to be here today with uh, the executive director of the American Geosciences Institute, Alison Anderson. Alison, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, Alison, I read in here something about the institute an institute that willy-nilly everybody that is listening, if they are a geologist, they are going to be involved with. So if you are like a homo geologist or something similar, uh, you could be like a homo hydrologist or a homo astronaut, something like that, uh, you are going to be interested in this show. Either because the AGI, which is the acronym of this American Geosciences Institute, it's advocating for you and for your funding, or maybe because it's spreading the word about your publications, or maybe because it's explaining to the Congress, uh, maybe the U.S. Congress, maybe also other Congresses, how important is your job. So uh, let me uh, say something about this American Geosciences Institute. Uh, it is an institute that was founded in 1948, it is an American institute, it is a non-for-profit, is a federation of scientific and professional associations, all of them related to the geoscience. So it's not just geology, but many other geoscientists. Presently, I think that we are uh, 51 associations, and I say we have, maybe 52 now, <laughs> and I say we have because I am a member of some of, that, of those associations. So if you're a member of one of the associations under the umbrella of AGI, you automatically are a member of AGI. In fact, it is a funny thing because AGI has no physical members. Uh, they have only associations. Uh, Anyhow, if you count all the members of all the associations, it seems that they reach a quarter of a million of virtual members. 250,000 geoscientists, they fall into this umbrella, or actually are underneath the umbrella. So the American Geoscience Institute provides information to geoscientists. It is a voice for shared interests among all of these associations and is involved in uh, geoscience education. Finally, this institute connects geosciences to the society. So, dear executive director of the American Geosciences Institute, do you agree with this short definition of uh, the AGI? I think it's a good, uh, good starting place. The other, the, the other piece that I didn't hear in there is we do a lot of work in the area of workforce, and so we have some distinct programs or departments within our um, organization, and we track K through 12 education, and we look at educational standards, um, and, and both in the public schools or, or wherever, whoever is doing earth science teaching. And we keep tracking the K through 12 to the point at which a uh, student has not yet declared that they want to be a geoscientist. And then we, sh we switch, and, and our workforce program uh, sort of kicks in at the point at which someone has declared a major, and then we track the progress of people through the higher education process and what, where they go through their various degree programs and then where they et ultimately end up. And hopefully in the future we'll be able to go even further and really track where so people stay. What is exactly the difference between the workforce and the educational part? Is the workforce is part of the educational goal? Well, so, so when people have studied workforce within the, any of the sciences, but particularly in the geosciences, there's some notable people that have studied workforce over the years. Um, even 10, 15 years ago, people had identified that if you don't get people in the STEM fields in early, a lot of people miss the opportunity to go into it because they hear about competing other professions like um, being a lawyer or a doctor or any number of other very respectable professions and maybe skipping over the science classes and things like that. So uh, it, with respect to the earth sciences and the geosciences, people really, what we find there is they're the accidental people who trip into that um, in college or at a university. I, I'm kind of one of those people myself. Uh, but then you have some people who got early exposure in the, like the eighth grade. So, so we see uh, earth science education really occurring in seventh and eighth grade in a lot of schools here in the United States. And then and other 
you know, there are places where they teach it in high school as well. So, uh, so we do, as a part of our education program, uh, write earth science teaching curricula uh, that meets the next generation science standard for, for earth science teaching here in the United States. What do you do practically? What is that uh, you or the volunteers, I think, uh, they really do in the schools? Do they go physically there? Do they teach? Do you have um, uh, programs where they can enroll? Do they see your icon of AGI? Those are all good questions. So so what we do as, as AGI is we, we function first as curriculum writers. All right, so there are not that many uh, organizations out there that write uh, curriculum, especially in the nonprofit side of things for earth science. I think we're pretty much the only game in town for that. There are other publishers that certainly write earth science curriculum. Our folks don't necessarily go into the schools and teach that. One area that we've recently developed is, is the capability uh, for our people in the education program to actually go into companies and go into organizations to teach volunteers. So let's say um, we'll pick, um, we'll pick an, a company we all know, um, say ExxonMobil. So let's say ExxonMobil has a volunteer program, and they, they want their volunteers to go out and consistently teach in the public schools, you know, like take your geoscientist to work day. Uh, they, they want them to teach the same kind of materials and be very predictably consistent. We can come in and provide uh, training materials and educational resources so that all the volunteers within their program can go into the schools and teach the same thing and teach it at the right level. So I think there's this idea that um, as scientists, we're all great teachers. Well, I'd love it if that were the case. Uh, that's not That doesn't always bear out because some of us are really good at teaching adults and some of us are really good at teaching kindergartners and some at junior high. And every level um, takes in science at a different in a different way. I fully agree. Yeah. Uh, one of my best professors uh, he was not capable to teach at all, <laughs> but he was genius, uh, really, really. So uh, the yeah. um, in this uh, political environment, is there anything special that we just scientists need to do for the K-12? Yes, actually, that's an, that's an area that we've been talking amongst some of our member organizations. The um, uh, NAGT is, is one such organization, the, I think it's National Association of Geoscience Teachers. Uh, they're one of our, our big educational partners. We've been talking about uh, how there's been a general lack of clear, consistent standards for earth science. So when you look at things like the next generation uh, science standard and common core curriculum, they'll call out some of the other sciences, but we may not necessarily get a call out in consistency. Then the other issue is that you see that um, not every state has the same standards. Okay, some people opt out. More recently, uh, within the last year, and you can go to your own conclusion space, what we've seen is a lot of the local communities are starting to come in and try to get creationism taught in the schools. Uh, recently, in one state, it was in the state of New Mexico, they had um, a group of people that wanted to uh, pull out teaching the age of the earth and some pretty fundamental core geoscience concepts. So this, this was a, a very heated debate at the state level that we followed and tracked to see, is this occurring other places around the United States? As geoscientists, we want to make sure that We've got some, consistent, con some consistency and that a non-science concept isn't taught in, in the classroom. And so um, the outcome was good. Uh, you know, they kept things the way they were and they didn't take out any essential components. So as a scientist, if we care about the next generation workforce right now, we're seeing a lot more of a struggle again at the state level for, for geoscience policy with respect to K through 12 teaching. What is that the geoscientists that are listening they can do if they want to do something for uh, the for the next generation? Well, so I'm going to use an example um, as a way of answering your question. So. We have, uh, at AGI, one of the things that we provide is the Ed Roy um, Earth Science Excellence in Teaching Award. And this highlights annually a, an earth science teacher in the K-12 space uh, who is really doing a stellar job and has great recommendations. They apply, and it's competitive. And, and this year's winner, um, MJ Tykowski, was really outstanding and exceptional. In her application materials, she talked about, because she is here in Texas, she talked about how... The, 
in her area, they were talking about taking maps out of the teaching curriculum. And it was such a fundamental concept, right? How do you get to KPFT if you don't have a map? <laughs> That's right. Oh, I, has, I have my friend Stefano who brought me here. Okay. So, so he's also a geologist and, and, for friends. and very good and at coffee. navigating. So, so you can always get a Stefano and, and he'll take you there. So, uh, but a map is really the way to go. So, so she actually started to go in and work at, at the state legislator level as, as just a normal Joe Q public person. But she wasn't. She was more than that. She was a geoscience teacher and a, a very good one at that. And so she felt very passionate and she was articulate and she worked with the state legislature to make sure that that, that standard, being able to keep math in the curriculum, and, and keep it there. And it did stay in there, ultimately. I view that as a huge success. So she's engaging at the local level. That's what we can be doing. And, and that's what we're hoping to start working on in the next year, is really thinking about how we can empower earth science teachers and people and parents in the community that want to see that earth science as a really robust and, and vital scientific bit of course. So dear geologists, do you listen to the executive director of the AGI? So be involved. Wake up, come out, <laughs> come knock at the door of this radio at 419 Lovett Boulevard in Houston or write us a mail at minigeology at gmail.com or just visit their website, minigeology.com, and, uh, and leave a comment. So we were talking about volunteering. Um, do we have a list of uh, an official list where the public schools, they can go and say, I would like to have somebody helping with... Uh, uh, the tectonics. Uh, can I go there and pick somebody that is expert and qualify and invite him to come and talk with my kids? We don't have a list like that because that, that's pretty hard to do. Uh, it would be great if we could, but instead we have 250,000 members within our 52 member organizations that when, when an educator calls us and says, hi, I'm a, I'm a teacher out in um, San Juan, or wherever I am, and, I really need someone to come and help me develop some coursework on landslides. What we do is we try to connect people to the resources that they need or a person, say at the U.S. Geological Survey or someone in their own backyard that has that expertise. So is it realistic that somebody in need of volunteers, they contact uh, the AGI for this? They certainly can call us or send us a note uh, to our education division or whichever appropriate volunteer tier group that you want to go to, or you can mini geo, you should send it, send yeah. it to you mini geology. And, then, uh, and then you can send it to us and get in touch with me and, and we can work to see. Of um, course. So how people, you people. people in New Mexico, you need us. So write at mini geology at gmail.com. <laughs> and, um, so is it more important, important education or awareness? I was talking with uh, one of your colleagues, um, uh, Marvin Boland. Oh, May Boland, yes. And she said, don't try to educate, but raise awareness. She said, I don't really care about how all of these little pieces of my car work. I really want to know about my car. Where do I have to bring it if it breaks down? Uh, how much it consumes? I don't really need that. And in another way, another analogy could be our body. We don't really know how our cells and the geobiochemical reactions occur. But we need to know that we need to be healthy and we need to have good food and train a little bit and read a good book and not do too many PowerPoints. And <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should just get rid of PowerPoint altogether. I, I would be a huge fan of that. <laughs> Guys, we don't have a PowerPoint here. There are no that. PowerPoints no, in the studio. Against, we no. are against the PowerPoints. <laughs> yeah. So I think that raising awareness is something easier. Like you can go and knock at the door of your neighbor and, and they don't give a, we can't say this word in the radio. We can say all the other 700,000, <laughs> but there are only seven words we can say. So, but you can go to the neighbor and say, look, you have to be aware that if you pave all of your backyard, you're not going to have any more soil to absorb the rain. This is important. This is awareness. I won't, I won't explain you why, but just be aware of that. Well, so, so the, I like Maeve's distinction on the education versus awareness. So, so I think that oftentimes it's like when you have the volunteers that go into the classroom. They come in, or classroom, they want to come in, basically tell the people what they think are the essential knowledge, right? 
Well, that person may not necessarily get it the way that they're told. And just being told something isn't the same as really understanding it, right? And so when we think, when we talk about education, it's a really formalized engagement that can happen in the classroom and or in an informal engagement through one of our other um, activities that we can do that sort of raises the awareness of what we do and what the geosciences are. Like case in point, we have what I would I, I consider to be a real flagship program is the Earth Science Week. And Earth Science Week, we're in our 20th year. It's, it's a big anniversary year for us here. Speaking of which, next year is our 70th anniversary as the American Geosciences Institute. So that should be fun. The um, With Earth Science Week, this is... Uh, what do you mean ours? So... Earth Science Week is... Uh, Earth Science Week is 20 this year, but next year, but AGI is 70. So it's AGI that is proposing, that is creating, that, that you created the AGI... The, the Earth Science, Earth Science Week. Week. Yeah, so we basically um, uh, maintain this entire program idea, and we have a lot of different partners, like the Park Service, the Geological Survey, uh, the... Um, <coughs> We've got the USGS, the, the GSA, we have American Geophysical Union. We have a lot of different people in our mem who are our members that participate. But we have a lot of federal partners as well as even Howard Hughes, um, is that right? Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So, so there, are, there are many different partners that we have for this that curate different activities that go into a toolkit every year. But it's not just a toolkit. Throughout an entire week in October, we, we have different theme days that we celebrate and, and promote different topics like geologic maps day or no kid left inside where that gets people outside to really explore geoscience out in the field that's funny so there are a lot of really fun things that happen during our earth science week uh, where we're headed with that program in the future is that we're going to expand it so even though there is a really concentrated week in october it'll really go the whole year where we're doing really fun engaging more like awareness and teaching moments with with our people and other volunteers across the U.S. And, and actually Earth Science Week is celebrated globally. And so we have done some analytical um, work and we feel it touches about 50 million people annually through this program. It's a really great program. Where is the threshold of national and international? How you define if, if this is national or international, it becomes global? Well, so we have taken our toolkits and a lot of our teaching materials associated with Earth Science Week to other countries and it's celebrated in different areas we've had down in Mexico and in China, Ecuador and other places and we continue to disseminate the toolkit uh, materials. They're actually a packet that, they, that you can have. But we're going to be moving to digital content as well and when you do that suddenly it, it's accessible worldwide and we do see quite a bit of our web traffic through the education piece as well as Maeve Boland's program who you spoke to. She's our uh, director of policy at the American Geosciences Institute. Uh, we get a lot of traffic through there on the awareness, what I would say is awareness side uh, through some of our fact sheets that talk about landslides or they talk about geoscience in your state. That's a new product that we just have that, that is up on the website that I would invite anyone listening to check out. So if, you want, if you're not listening in Houston and you're listening someplace, go and check out geology in your state. It's, a, it's really interesting because everything is tailored towards what's in your backyard. So how many of these uh, 52 associations under the umbrella of the American Geosciences Institute are uh, foreigners? So that's a tricky question right now. So we have our official members, and then we have international affiliates as well. So, so of, the, of the 52 members, a lot of the people that are members of those organizations are international, right? And so while the, the organization itself might be a U.S.-affiliated kind of organization or incorporated here in the U.S., they have, when you look at somebody like the Geological Society of America, they have quite a few international members. Same goes for the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. Um, you've got that with SE, both SEGs, so you, you, there are two. There's the Economic Geologists, and then there's the Exploration Geophysicists. Two acronyms, different, two, different yes, associations. Yes, different associations, yeah, both with S, SEGs. I so we have 25,000 acronyms <laughs> in my company, so two more. That's yeah, yeah, we do have moments from time to time where there are clarification <laughs> points between which which SEG are we talking about? But we have international affiliates, and that's a different kind of, um, uh, kind of like a membership category, uh, where it's, they're actually, like the Geological Society of London is one of our affiliated partners. That's a good example of one. 
and um, so you say that this is um, is, is is basically American centric, uh, even if we have some satellites around the world, mm -hmm. but mainly our associations based in the U.S. Uh, right? Uh, yeah, the lion's share. I, I would say that we've grown a lot of our yeah. partnerships over the years, so we affiliate with um, within, quite a few international within organizations. The, uh, associations. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the um, balance in between associations related to industry and associations related to academia? Uh, that's a really good point of distinction here. So these are all professional societies or organizations and so uh, they usually have a mix of academics and industry people and nonprofits and people who work in the government. So it's a I don't know all of those numbers because we don't actually see the individual uh, breakouts of the membership of each one of our members. Uh, you know, there isn't really one organization that's solely academic or solely, you know, I will say if, if you look at the Earth Science Editors, it's a pretty good bet they're editors <laughs> because it's in their title. So, so that's a very, that's a much more narrow group of people versus being, you know, academic versus something else. There's still probably a mix of editors that edit for academic you know, publications versus yeah. versus maybe an industry trade publication. So you, you can't really differentiate the societies based on that because we have a really big mix of different professionals. But what is your feeling? I'm trying to understand uh, where is the um, point of view of such an important um, uh, institute like, like yours? Like, do you think that most of your members, they work for the university or for private companies? I I can't even speculate. I can't I can't speculate since we don't we don't get all of that individual demographic kind of data. Well, uh, that could be important, right? Because depending on the problems that we want to tackle, mm -hmm. the members that are going to react or overreact, uh, depending on their affiliation. Yeah. What's interesting is you can ask, and probably most of our member organizations. There are a couple notable ones, like um, if I'm thinking about the. Um, AIPG, the American Institute of Professional Geoscientists, they tend to be a lot more in the private sector and consulting. So, but a lot of them come from a very, a lot of them do teaching and they're academic on the side. So, so that's another example of they, they might actually do both, you know. Like right now, I am someone who's working a nonprofit, but I still affiliate with um, teaching at the Georgetown University. So, um, so I'm a part of a program there, Science in the Public Interest program, as, an, as the energy scholar for that program. So, well, um, what you would certainly know is among of these 52 associations, what are the shared interests? Because the, the diversity is so huge that it's going to be difficult to find a couple of things that they are important for all of the 52. Oh, so so this is an excellent point, and I I would say that um, all of our organizations care a lot about education. They all care about workforce. They may not have the the uh, manpower or the resources to do that, and I think that's why we really focus on those areas. One thing we try very hard to do is look for the common areas that represent everybody. Uh, the majority of our 52 members really care about what's happening on the policy side, and many people just don't engage. There, they don't have the resources, and in some organizations, they very specifically state that they're not going to be engaged directly in any kind of advocacy at all. And so that's an area where we, we can fulfill a need because they, their members say that they, as an organization, don't want to do it. So, so we try to really look broadly about what we can do because we are a member-driven organization. Our members just are. The groups of people. So, so we're, we're taking a really good hard look at how to really enhance membership for our members as well. We did just um, uh, add a new member and we're very excited. It's the American Meteorological Society. Uh, they're, they're a very long-standing group of, of scientists and, and quite respected and we are so, so very deeply grateful that they have decided to come and be a part of our big group of people. I feel like we're more complete with them in the mix. Uh, 
I, you know, our number of 250,000 people actually didn't include them initially. So maybe we would add 30 more thousand on there. <laughs> maybe we're closer to doing What are the associations <laughs> that are left out? Do you still see some associations that they could be agglutinated to the AGI and they are not uh, members yet? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting in that area, too. I think we've captured most of the 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 really substantial bigger ones and, and midsize. And there are some specialty ones that might be really, really small. But like, for instance, there's an organization that we have been talking with for quite some time, and it's the Gemological Institute of America. They are such a wonderful potential partner and, and an area that we'd like to continue to talk with. Uh, they're they're geoscientists. Is there any scrutiny that you have to do or some associations that they may be bad for the AGI? Or how do you define or you welcome uh, everybody related to the geoscience? Well, so like an individual company can't be a member, right? So you have to be a professionally focused uh, type of geoscience organization. And we do have, there are some, some definitions for that, and I don't know this off the top of my head, but <laughs> so, so that would be something I'd have to get back to you yeah, on. Yeah, because just imagine that our dear friends in New Mexico, they create an association where they believe that the Earth is 6,000 years old. <laughs> They're still geoscientists, but yes. wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there are, and also you should know, um, just because you want to join doesn't mean you automatically get to join. You actually have to submit an application with us, uh, some materials, and then we have a member society council that votes on that membership. And in the case of the Meteorological Society, we did have a un unanimous vote. Everyone was very, very excited about that. We're thrilled. Very good. So uh, we talk about industry and academia. Are there any other polls, even if we have only two polls in our planet, oh, but are oh, there any no, other no, this is polls not a... that they represent clusters of associations like, I don't know, I think about like policy making or who, who else could be a, a, a good cluster of associations? Well, you know, what's interesting is that people sort of sort based on their specialty area more than the sector they come from, right? And I think what's great about all of our member organizations uh, is that they'll have a really great mix of different kinds of professionals, which makes their membership much more uh, engaged and diverse, and they get to have a lot more rigor in their dis in their scientific discussions. And and that's one of the things I'm actually, if I could just veer off that for a minute, the word rigor. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about that lately, rigor in all of the sciences. Uh, there was a really interesting book that was written by Richard Harris. He was talking about, it's called Rigor Mortis. If, you, if you're listening and you haven't yet read, the, I'm, I'm not actually like shilling for his book, but I will say that is a provocative read. It's talking about rigor in biomedical uh, research, both in the private sector and in academia. And it was fascinating. If you've spent any time in a medical institution, it's kind of going to blow your mind what you read in there about wh how they're doing research and where some of the error propagation might be and things like that. But it's made me think, and I've been talking with some of the other executive directors in our member organizations a little bit more about um, the days when, if, I don't know if, if you guys can recall, because I don't know how old we all are in this room. And just, oh, I'm 102. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was a time where people got together at of scientific, course I remember. Yeah, yeah, at scientific meetings, and they actually had kind of some heated discussions about science, right? I mean, I can think of one of my greatest heroes uh, in terms of, uh, I don't know what words I can or can't say. I'm going to say... Um, seriously awesome field geologist. I, the other word I use is bad bleep, to describe Harlan Bretz. Okay, he is somebody who um, years ago, I can't remember when he was alive, earlier in the last century, and he mapped an area, the Palouse Luss out in, in the uh, Washington area, and really looked at the channeled scablands that you see out in Washington State and tied it all back to catastrophic outburst flooding right, from Glacial Lake Missoula. I love this story. This guy was amazing. He did this all with field mapping on foot, like conventional, traditional geology. When's the last time somebody did that without an air photo and was able to see a ripple mark that was literally like 30 meters high? Nobody believed him. I mean, there was, there was actual discussion. People thought he was crazy. You know, who's this guy who says there's mega ripples? No one thought that that could happen. When they first took the first air photos of that area, 
it it actually showed exactly what he'd been mad. I mean, probably he wasn't one hundred percent right, but you know, it, history will be kind and remember the fact that like he was a great field geologist, but there was rigor in the discussion, and really a heated debate, plate tectonic theory, rigor, like big discussion. When I go to meetings, I hope I get to see that rigor and that really that great excitement around a scientific idea, right? That that's part of what I liked when I came into the geosciences, and I'm seeing both of you nod. So, so keep in mind, listeners, we have Dan and we have <laughs> Stefano <laughs> Mazzoni, who is also a geoscientist here in Houston. Yeah, we have a, a friend of many <laughs> geology, of course. Yes, yes. So, so, so we're all nodding that that you know that that excitement is what drives us. That How comes that we lost this rigor? Well, I I think there is a lot of rigor, but. You know, people present. There have been many times. I mean, when's the last time you guys went to a, a meeting where people got together and someone presented some something, and people ask questions. People will ask questions, but there's no big discussion in the meetings when someone's presenting a poster. You've got like eight minutes, and then you have like a couple yeah. minutes for questions. Well, and then you have also to be polite. Yes, and yes. Then you can't be rough. And uh, there are many levels before reaching the sincere, intellectual, uh, honest discussion. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think there still are some really great forums out there where people go and they really debate ideas. Well, if you subtract all of those that they uh, have PowerPoints, I think there are no meetings. <laughs> so we're back to the PowerPoints <laughs> again. Like maybe we should take that away and then people will actually have to just, sit in a room like we're doing and have a conversation yeah, about and that. And just think if we, if we had a map here. Oh, yes. Yeah, we might disagree which is yeah. the North Arrow there. No, of I'm course. kidding. <laughs> and a couple of beers, of course. Yes, yes. Uh, well, so um, uh, I was trying to understand what are the bridges that you build in between these different um, clusters of association. So it is clear to me that you build it in between academia and industry and the policymakers. Yep. Because I participated to the Geoscience Congressional uh, Day, and I really thank you for organizing that. It was um, exceptional. Uh, something that everybody uh, should experience to go there to Washington, D.C and to walk for eight long hours up and down the hill and go and see uh, and visit the senators and the congressmen and the congresswomen or their staff and have the experience of the pace that they have, the kind of understanding that they get quickly. Even if they are not interested, they get what you want to say. And, oh my gosh, I'm so proud, my mother. So I sent a picture of it. <laughs> I, it seems to her that I talk with the president, regardless who is the president. That doesn't matter. It's just the president of the United States of America. And so thank you very much for organizing that. Are there any other bridges that you are building and I'm not aware of? Well, actually, another one is between schools mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, and you that are like a focal point. I imagine yourself like a... a the center of a polygon where everybody is looking at you. I think it's more like we're the center of the wheel. The center and of the, the wheel. And the spokes come in, right? Well, well, wait a second. You said 52 associations. <laughs> There's like 52 it's, spokes? Not no. infinite associations. <laughs> okay. But well, I think, well, by the way, are you like trying to reach out for more associations? Well, certainly. I mean, if, if we have... If we see that there are some other interested people that would like, and other organizations that would be interested in joining. Is AGI inter interested in um, welcoming associations, big associations that they are residing in completely different countries? We we will have to fundamentally change what uh, the definition of a member is currently, and we're going to we're, we're thinking about that right now. But they can we we actively partner through affiliated uh, channels, so we have an international affiliates category for any kind of international organization so what? the answer is mostly yes they mm. don't fit the same sort of membership um, criteria they get all the same benefits basically I think. by the way what are the benefits of becoming a member that's a that's a really um, excellent question the there are a lot of different kinds of what I would call the less tangible like you don't point to I got 50 of the 50 copies of that book so a lot of it is in what you've already illustrated and what we've talked about it's that connectivity to different resources and people for instance um, we had the uh, American Institute of uh, professional geologists they 
they have their annual meeting and they were looking for some uh, educational kinds of engagements and they actually worked with us to develop a workshop to pilot at their meeting um, to see how well it would work in terms of training some of their folks to go into the schools. That was one of the programs. That, that, that's actually called Go In. So uh, I can't remember actually what it's short for, but basically to teach people to go oh, into classrooms. Oh, is, it, is it an acronym? Yeah, oh it is. Gosh. It is. Or it's or not an acronym and it's strict. Well, it is actually in this case. It is not, instead of an abbreviation because people always kind of mix those two things up. So, uh, so Oh, yeah, acronyms are not like in the past anymore. <laughs> no, like no, every no. Single call, every kind of short form is called word. an acronym now. So... Uh, so and in this case, that was that was a partnership through our membership. You know, they're they're a member of us, and we work together to develop something that we'll actually be able to use with other member organizations and, as well as partners out in various communities. Uh, there are things like we have the geoscience working group. That's a big consortium of different uh, geoscientific groups that all do policy work, and we coordinate very regularly across all of those groups. We. If you were, a, let's say you're a smaller member and you don't have your own advocacy, a part of your portfolio, and you can't afford to do that, we do that on behalf of our members as well in terms of looking at broad themes. In fact, I had brought with me, and, and our listeners cannot see this. No, but they can imagine. But they can imagine. They can go to our website and download, it, download this document. It's called Geoscience for America's Critical Needs. It's an invitation to a national policy dialogue. Describe the brochure. And um, it's well, blue. it's blue. Uh, but <laughs> when you look at it di digitally, you can literally just go in and go straight on Google and put put in it one string geoscience for America's critical needs. This should actually pop up. Say again slowly. Geoscience for America's critical needs. And this is something that our team worked with our our then 51 member societies. But I actually think um, there's probably a 52 that was represented in this too because their interests are in here too and, and what they wanted to do when they were creating this so this is Mae Boland's uh, team since you've met her I'm, I'm connecting you yeah, back to her I met many of your good colleagues yeah yeah, yeah we have some really tremendously talented people at, at AGI so there are some themes in here that that were highlighted so that as so this is a 2016 document so as they were going into the the election cycle and the discourse kind of like was all over the place in the debates. You know, it's nice to have something. Hey, if you're going to talk about science, maybe you should talk about these really critical issues, which is why this is called America's Critical Needs document. And so it's literally an invitation to, to talk with people about it. So the themes in here are water, energy. I'm just going through page by page. Natural hazards, soils mineral resources, oceans and coasts, climate change, waste disposal, workforce and education. And then there's a nice description about what do the geosciences include and it talks about all of all of my my greatest hits reel of of how the geoscience is related to everything in modern society. So so this document really um, drew in all of the biggest needs of all of our different member organizations and put it in a way that um, is not political this is this is hey let's talk about it it's it's really an invitation to get people thinking and to raise the discourse you know and really really engage people a little bit more meaningful on really big societal needs so who's paying for that print print out who's funding agi this agi funded it where does the money come from so uh so that's very interesting we we actually get uh Part of our, our income comes from member dues, but we also have uh, some, some products that we publish because we are also a publisher. So some of that is our earth science curriculum for in K through 12. It's actually more like 6 through 12 because you really don't teach a lot of organized uh, earth science classes until grade 6. Some, some a little bit in the fifth grade. And then we have lab manuals. So we have a lab manual that we partner with NAGT on. So that's another benefit is, is oftentimes we uh, partner with our members on, on publications. Uh, we also have a magazine. It's called Earth. So if you don't have that, you can, you can go in, on our website and su subscribe to that. The, then, and then the other bigger thing, and, and if people up until now, a, the American Geosciences Institute isn't familiar, if you're at home and you're listening uh, and you've ever used a reference database called GeoRef, AGI is the publisher and the maker of that. Okay, It's the only 
geoscientific database that catalogs and abs all the abstracts in the world in from multiple languages into English, we are the only one. So a, a lot of our, our baseline income comes from all of those those products as being a publisher and an information service. I so, know it very well. Yes, GRF. yes. I remember some of my colleagues say, oh, if you're not in GRF, you're nobody. <laughs> well, so yes, and you can get your own ID number for your publications now and track yourself, and, and, and that's listed in GRF as well. So we have a lot of different kinds of databases and, and that piece of it. Our policy um, work, we, we try to self-fund that, actually. We want to make sure that uh, there is never, ever... Uh, an opportunity for someone to say that we were being political, and so we we stay as nonpartisan. It either has to be all partisan or it has to be nonpartisan. We choose to be nonpartisan, and and keep our mitts out of the politics. That, that, we bring science, yeah, and and we really want to talk about those critical needs through that now lens. That's something very um, uh, ambiguous when a politician takes part in a scientific debate, mm -hmm. and so the politician. Uh, decides to take part in one of the two sides, at that point, science becomes political. Mm -hmm. And we made this example about the age of the earth. So if you right. have a politician or a political party that takes part in uh, uh, supporting a group of geologists that they believe that the earth is 6,000 years old, then you, AGI, is a must for you to say, no, that is wrong. So you can avoid to be political sometimes. Well, I, I, that's a point well taken, I, although we would argue that in making that argument, it's not us being political. It's actually presenting scientific knowledge, uh, something that's been very rigorously, let's bring in the rigor again, okay, the age of the earth has been very rigorously studied, peer-reviewed, debated over time, and so, so that is, is very, yeah, but very accepted in the scientific universe. The very important thing is here is that it seems that they are trying to uh, undermine the base of the pillars of science. Mm -hmm. So somebody doesn't want just scientists to be rigorous. Somebody doesn't want, they say now, to believe in science. It's not really, this concept of believing in science is completely awkward. You don't really believe in science. You, you, you have a method that you follow, mm -hmm. and that's it. So, so it seems that um, the um, topics are, are way above the discussion among scientists. So at some point, I think that some associations need to step up without the fear to uh, become political. Well, I think that there are some, some of the, in the, the sphere of broader science, I think that there are quite a few scientific nonprofits or organizations that are out there, not for profit or nonprofit, doesn't really matter. I think there are plenty of scientific organizations that, that, that get into the fray a little bit more and, and will. Um, try to be more, a little bit more aggressive in that space. That's that's just not our space. We are not. Yeah. This is something like Greenpeace. Uh, I I I don't know enough about Greenpeace, honestly, to say whether or not Greenpeace they're one of them. Greenpeace is not part of AGI. No, 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 <laughs> no. They're they're not. They they definitely don't fit our member criteria and have never really identified as being a ge geoscience organization. So, but and I I know enough about that to say that they they definitely don't fit our criteria. So, do you accept as AGI donations? We do, we do, absolutely. We um, uh, we always look for. Uh, donations, whether it's just, you know, an people do annual giving, kind of like KPFT probably has an annual fundraising thing. And you of course. Like for a full we day. Ha we, yeah. have a, <laughs> we have two full days. Actually, let me say, we have three full weeks every quarter. We wow, that's a lot. Here. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, you're going to be coming up on giving to, I'm just going to, like, give you a, a shameless promotion here. You know, we nonprofit people, we got to all stick, stick together on this, but Giving Tuesday, everybody goes out in the nonprofit space and actually looks to see if they can raise um, some funds for various programs. And so um, the shameless plug on that is that this year we, we are trying to, for Giving Tuesday, um, raise some more money for our Wallace Scholarship. It's called the Wallace Scholarship, and that goes for uh, female uh, master's and Ph.D. level students. 
and that that's like uh, an annual scholarship for each, I think, of about $5,000. So if you're one of those students and you're listening, you should apply to the Wallace Scholarship. We're actually hoping to get that endowed. It's about halfway to its endowment stage right now. So we would like to see that become very sustainable so that it can keep going well into future generations of female geoscientists. So talking about female geoscientists, here, um, Ellison, your executive director of the American Geoscience Institute, and uh, I know you were also president of the Association for Women Geoscientists. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the status of the art of women in geoscience? You know, as I can speak on this because I am a woman, but uh, but if I were not a woman, anybody else could probably think about the status of women. I think right now when you look at the the workforce statistics and, and the, the gender balance, uh, there are parts in, in tracking where people are going when they come out of school and women still fall out at somewhat predictable stages in both the educational process and then kind of, you know, as they get into their career again, if they decide to go and have families, I think that'll continue to get better as more employers um, have parental benefits versus a maternity benefit so that you have this, if you're a, a couple that has men and women and they can, you know, guys are encouraged to actually go and take paternity time with their child, then a woman can come back maybe a little sooner and there's a little bit more engagement for both parents. That's been a, a notable issue, not just in the geosciences, but pretty much for everything. You know, when you've got a couple that in traditionally a woman has been the one that takes the time off. It's harder in the STEM fields, particularly in geoscience, to come back. It's like for, I once heard this number when I was working at ExxonMobil that they said for every day that someone's out of the job, we need two additional days to train them to come back in when they go on leave. So if you took like a half year sabbatical, they assume it will take you a full year to come back and come up to speed to where you were before. Uh, so let, let's conclude with um, why, why, why geoscience is, uh, is critical for society, which is a very important question and we want to finish with this now so we can uh, let our listeners that are not geoscientists understand why geoscience is important for uh, the society. Okay, so uh, something I like to do for fun in my spare time, which is definitely infinite at this point. No, I, 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 as part of kind of how I think about geoscience, I write little short articles and put them up on, on LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever. And thematically right now, I'm really trying to get people to think about how without geoscience, you wouldn't have any of today's basic amenities. I'm not even talking to your iPhones. I'm talking about clean drinking water. Okay, if we didn't have geoscientists out there working on water quality and actually sustainable water resources, I mean, we just came out of major drought conditions out in California and in the West. Geoscience is the heart of that. That those are big, big problems that we face globally. Other areas, food. You don't have food if you don't have a geoscientist working on the soil component of it. You need to mine for agricultural products such as potash or other fertilizers even down to the clothes people wear. Okay, You're not going to get cotton again if you don't have really fertile soil to sustain the making of cotton. Alternative, the vegan leather that people wear, that's probably brought to you by the hydrocarbon industry. And, and that's something, it's a synthetic product that comes out in the supply chain. There are so many different ways, geoscience and health, Okay, we take for granted that the air we breathe is clean. There are parts of the world it isn't. Every time you do a home improvement project, you rip out some, some uh, drywall, you're breathing that, you're breathing in probably some gypsum and other minerals. Is that good for you? Well, geoscientists study that. So, so much of what we do and we take for granted in modern society starts with geoscience. We are, t p total pun intended, we are the bedrock of modern society. And without the whole geoscientific community at its base, we wouldn't even get to things like iPhones, right? Or all of those other things, the electrons we take for granted that power our homes, brought to you by geoscience. So, so that's my, my, my closer. But I want to I wanna close and say, AGI's mission is corely in that area. Uh, we represent and serve the geoscience community by providing collaborative leadership and information to connect the earth, science, and people. Very good. Yeah. So with that is all, thank you very much, Alison. Alison Anderson, Executive Director of the American Geoscience Institute. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for being a friend of mini geology. Thanks for Stefano for coming in here, <laughs> and I uh, hope to see you soon. This mic is open for you. Whenever you want, come back. Thank you. Thanks for having me.